This is Dance Studio 411, where we answer your real life questions about your toughest studio life predicaments parent problems, teacher turnover, student challenges, policy dilemmas, and so much more. Let's talk about what's keeping you awake at night and what you can do about it. Here are your hosts, Suzanne Blake Garrity and Jill Tyrone. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of our Dance Studio 411 podcast. I'm very excited about today's topic as we are joined by our special guest, Sam Wessler. She is a dance teaching artist and educator. Sam believes that empowering students to take charge of their education and delve into what moves them will lead us to become a society of open-minded, passionate learners and observers. Sam passionately believes that dance classes for adolescents must be inclusive for all types of students. As an openly queer woman, she advocates for LGBTQIA plus dancers and dance families to make sure that these spaces are affirming and safe. Sam is from Pennsylvania and it is where she discovered dance at a young age, training at various studios until her college career. She holds a BA in dance from Slippery Rock University of Pennsylvania and an MFA in performance and choreography from the University of Colorado Boulder. She is also the curriculum director at Kathy Blake Dance Studios in Amherst, New Hampshire, where she teaches contemporary improvisation and composition. She is also on the faculty for theater and dance and the department at Phillips Exeter Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire. When Sam is not teaching dance, she is the family liaison at Windsor Mountain International Summer Camp in Windsor, New Hampshire, where she has been on the staff for eight years. Sam also speaks on the topics related to LBGQTIA plus and trains dance educators on how to build diversity and inclusion into their studio curriculum. So I'm excited that Sam is here today because she is on the faculty at my dance studio, but more so she has an extraordinarily creative heart, mind, and she has won numerous choreography awards, but she is helping us today better understand the topic of gender and sexuality identity gender and sexual identity inclusion training for dance studios. And I'm really excited about this because it is needed and timely. So welcome, Sam. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. You and I have been talking about this for a long time and the time is now. It really is. And I'm just so grateful that you've had the support of, I think, I believe, you know, the, the dance community. And I know that right, like recently on our dance studio owner, um, member forum, someone asked the question of, can we start a healthy discussion about how to be inclusive for dancers who are non-binary? And that this studio owner was saying, you know, I need some additional training and understanding and how to make sure we create a studio culture that remains inclusive to all dancers. So um, I know you have so much to share and I'll let you kind of kick it off with what your your tips are. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So like you said, the time is definitely now. And I think that it can be tough for dance studios. There's a lot of resources and information out there for dance in higher ed or even dance in a school where the institution is probably doing a lot. And there's just not a lot out there for studios themselves. And I think that looking at policies, like I think that member discussed specifically, like dress codes is a really great way to start. And I think one of my biggest pieces of advice is to do it before you need it, right? You don't want to be necessarily making policy change and that sort of thing because a student needs it. You want it to be existing and be there so that when a student needs it, they're like, oh, this is already there. And then they're not feeling like further singled out or anything like that. Um, And I think specifically like uniform and dress code policies need us to really look at what we really need right? We don't necessarily need a leotard. We don't necessarily need tights, even in ballet classes. This is something I feel very strongly about. I know it can be a controversial opinion, but if what we're really getting at is seeing a student's lines, well, I can do that in bike shorts. I can do that in leggings. I can do that in a more slim cut t-shirt that doesn't even necessarily need to be skin tight. I can do that in a tank top. There are lots of other ways that I can see a student's lines that are going to feel not only more inclusive for a dancer who is non-binary or maybe not sure what their gender identity is, but also for a lot of our young dancers who are struggling with their changing bodies. You know, so these are 
dress code changes that could do a lot for a lot of different dancers. Um, I think one of the comments even suggested wording your policy of long hair versus short hair. You know, if your hair reaches a certain length, it's got to go up in a certain way. If it's shorter than that, then it needs to get bobby pinned or head banded out of your eyes. So just really looking at the way you're wording dress codes. And this is something I've actually worked at um, at the camp I work at as well is taking, I think it's a very common uh, like phrase in dress codes to be like boobs, bellies, and butts. And I'm like, that's super gendered. Yes. It's super gendered. And we don't think about it, you know? And like when I teach, I use anatomical terms instead of like slang for body parts. And if you think about that, so saying like chest or sternum, um, midriff, you know, that sort of thing. And if you want to be specific about shorts, maybe asking for bike shorts, because those on dancers of any height or leg length is probably going to cover what you want covered. Yeah. So I think it's important because I know that our listeners, um, everybody sort of has their degree of understanding sort of this gender and sexual identity inclusion. We're all in a different spectrum of understanding. So I think it's important that we back up and say, you know, could you give us sort of like the easy to understand overview of pronoun use? Because I think that's where a lot of us trip up. And I know, especially with Zoom, I I know it kicked off with Zoom. So what with Zoom kicking off, a lot of studio owners came to us and said, oh, kids are um, renaming their names on the screen and then indicating their pronouns within their name typed. Um, so, so again, higher ed, I'm, I'm in graduate school myself. Higher yeah. ed is much more, um, this is just how it rolls. Everybody just identifies their pronouns. At the studio level, we've never seen kids have to type their name on a screen. And so some people right. are like, I don't know if their parent knows this. I don't know how to address it. So let's start with pronoun use if we could. Yeah, for sure. So I think a really big thing is keep an open mind and remember that they are kids. And while they are kids and might be discovering things, they also really know who they are. So my big advice is to take kids at their word and don't don't question it because they're already questioning so much. And if you as an adult who they've obviously trusted to say like, hey, I'm using they, them pronouns. If you're like, really, are you sure? That's oof, not going to feel good. Some of the more common pronouns that you're probably going to run across are he, him, his, she, her, hers, they, them, theirs. And then there's something called neo pronouns, which I won't go super into because they're actually really not that common, um, which might be like a Z, Zare, Zares sort of deal. Um, I think the most common ones that I've come across are either he, him, his, she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. And I know for a lot of people, Um, Using they as a singular can feel really tricky, but if you think about it, we do it a lot. If you're like, oh, whose leotard is this? Oh, I'll just stick it in the office office and give it to them when we figure out who it belongs to. You just did it. So it's something that's already kind of there. And even when you slip up, when it's something new, don't make a big deal out of it. Just correct yourself quickly and move on. I've definitely done it. Um, I've had a few students whose pronouns have definitely evolved in my time teaching them. And sometimes I slip up and I'll be like, can you grab her there and just move on? Right. It's okay to stumble and make it part of the dance. Absolutely. As they say. Yeah. <laughs> you just roll into the next step and you just exactly. correct it and you don't make a big deal. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I think that the fact that you corrected yourself instead of going with it is going to mean a lot more to that student than you may realize. The, and that's so great. So if, if you're listening to this and you're like, oh, okay, we've never really had much practice in this. Well, now is your turn. You can practice they, them on people who haven't told you, you know what I mean? You can, right. you can try it out, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I've really tried to start consciously using they, them pronouns until I know different. And I have made it part of my first day of class at the studio, at PEA, wherever I'm teaching is do a circle, have students introduce themselves to, even if this is a group that's been together for 10 years, sometimes even nicknames change. There was a point in my life where I went by Samantha. I never would ever now. 
But, you know, sometimes nicknames change and just having them say their pronouns as well is super helpful. And that way you kind of know where they're, what the standing point is. And is there an age at which that is most appropriate to start that conversation in your experience? I think that that can be tricky, Um, especially now kids are a lot more aware. They have the internet. They are being introduced to really awesome information at a younger age. So I do have some mixed age classes. I think the youngest I've done it is with 10. And this goes back to, you know, it's evolving and it's great. We're having this conversation, which actually leads me to my next question within the pronoun conversation. We had a great that dialogue on our member group recently that kind of prompted us to finally record this session was um, practicing this ungendered language. And I've been taking this on as my own personal mission in the last year when we created a new diversity, equity, and inclusion um, committee internally at Revolution. And then um, within the work I'm doing at graduate school. And then of course, you and you have been a great um, influence on me personally to really take this on here with our, with our listeners and our, in our dance industry. So Ungendering our language also takes practice. So I have a couple of examples that I know I've broken my own mold on, and maybe you yeah. have some examples too. So maybe you could tell us, like, what does that mean to ungender your language? Yeah, so I think the biggest one is addressing a group of students. I think there's a really big tendency to be like, hey, ladies, or hey, girls, or even the hey, guys, which is hard for me. Uh, because that's just how I grow up. It's like y'all for me. And that one has taken a lot of work. We're lucky in the dance studio world that we have built in replacements. Hey, dancers. Perfect. You just accomplished what you needed to accomplish. Hey, parents. Uh, Hey, teachers. Hey, tappers. Like, look, you're done. Um, (laughs) And then if you're looking at dress codes, like I said, just doing it based maybe by style and subject, hair length, Again, referring to bodies as more anatomical terms, which is really good for education anyway, um, especially including some anatomy and kinesiology using, you know, anatomical terms as opposed to like slang or something like that. It's really the great one. You know, the hey guys, hey ladies, hey girls, it flows off your tongue and you might not even realize it. I still catch myself. I'm like, oh, there it is again. Um, But it's good that the consciousness, this goes back to ready self-awareness. Right. Bringing light to it. We're modeling the best version of this for everybody to make an inclusive space. That is, and this goes back to um, what does it mean to create a safe space at your studio? And I think if everyone listening to this um, just takes away a couple of things is that creating the safe space, it takes a consciousness for everyone involved in holding it. So for me at our studio where you are on our faculty, that was my primary objective to make sure that people who are transgendered going through whatever, um, if they're transitioning, if they are coming out, if they are feeling like they need to be heard, like that our studio welcomes them. And you are such a blessing to come into the space at the right time as someone who was able to confidently, you know, come out with your, with, with your lifestyle and our lifestyle should be no different than your lifestyle and your relationship should be no different than my relationship just because it fits into a standard picture. Right. It can make people nervous. And I was like, absolutely not. If you're married to a woman, if I'm married to a man or if a husband, you know, why, why not have this be the whole family? So I just kind of want your thoughts on that. The languaging I like to use around like the idea of safe spaces is brave spaces that I want to create a space where my students feel brave and empowered to be themselves and to figure out who they are, you know? So it's not just where they feel safe to be themselves, but I want them to feel brave enough to maybe try something else on. Um, And I think that we're really lucky in the dance world that we make such incredible personal connections with our students and are so involved in so many aspects of their lives that we might see more of this than a school teacher does because we're connected with them on such a different level. And I think that it's up to studios to really decide how far they want to go, you know, to go beyond tolerance through accepting, through embracing and really letting yourselves embrace members of the LGBTQ community um, and let them know that they have a home there Um, that they are accepted there, that you see them as 
people not just like everyone else because there is so much unique to the community and I think even going seeing the struggle and how hard it can be to be a member of the LGBTQ community and be like we know it's hard and here you are safe you can be brave and you are loved I love that so a brave space so we talked about a couple of ways to foster that brave space looking at your dress code with fresh eyes and saying, instead of this being a male, female, or a boy, girl dress code, how about looking at it from distinctions on long hair, short hair, dress code, I've seen it titled dress code A, dress code B, you can give alternative options um, to, to be inclusive. The second thing we just talked about was ungendering language, which is a great practice in life, right? Not just at the right. student studio is a great place to practice that because as you just said, look at us, how lucky we are. Hello, tappers. Hello, dancers. We have all sorts of fun names we can give our group of students that doesn't have to be about their, their, you know, anatomical gender um, or what have you. So um, there's that. And then of course, um, to your point, it's more than just acceptance. It's really embracing a safe, brave space. So I think that kind of moves into the next area I wanted to address with you, which was, let's talk about the studio physical environment, which what comes up a lot for our members and our our studio owners is the physical space, bathrooms, changing rooms, how we handle that kind of a thing. So, I mean, I know every physical space is different. Not everyone has the option. How how is it best to address this moving forward at your studio? Yeah. As best you can to ungender your bathrooms. I think if you've got a single stall situation, then you're already set, Um, which we at the studio are lucky enough to have. Here at camp, we have a bathroom that I actually um, helped ungender back in 2017. And we had one side that was just stalls. And we had one side that was stalls and urinals. And we literally just labeled them as that bathroom with stalls or just toilets bathroom and toilets and urinals and we realized that we had some weird gaps at the bottom and at the top and we just made little curtains so there you've kind of created personal individual stalls within that and then you can still ungender them I mean really people are going in and doing their business and that's it right um and even doing that could help provide a changing space for a student who doesn't feel comfortable in another changing space if you can create maybe curtained off sections if you have a bigger dressing room. And also in the time of COVID and it helps cut down on lost and found and so many other things to encourage your kids to come to class dressed. Well, I know many of you listening, we have those pop-up changing tents that we bring to competitions that are, they pop up and then you never can really fold them back down. Yeah, that's why I laughed. (laughs) I can't fold (laughs) them. They're, they're very inexpensive. I use them. um, My daughter's in a theater company. Theater is a place where this conversation has been luckily widely accepted for a long time, hitting like the main street dance studio a little more, which is why I'm glad we're having this conversation. But those pop-up tents are inexpensive on Amazon. If you need to temporarily use them, then they fold back down and you're good to go. So that's a great, absolutely great tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, a lot of dancers would prefer a private place to change. They might be feeling self-conscious or maybe they're just more modest. So these are changes that can help out a lot of your dancers in many different ways. Exactly. Um, That kind of leads me into the next area that we have to navigate, which is Let's talk about parents, dance parents. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dance parents. We love them. And yet we, we learn so much from them because they yes. <laughs> sometimes don't love what we're doing. So For sure. wherever you want to go with this, I know we're going to talk a little bit about navigating those who disagree, but also mm-hmm. in language for families. So I'm just going to let you kind of go with your thoughts. Yeah. So I, I, I'll first say um, I have a lot of experience with dealing with families um, of all sorts of kinds, not just families that include parents. And that was actually a big change that I made for myself was stop referring to parents and start saying families. Okay. Because That's families good. could include, you know, mom, dad, stepdad, parents or families could include maybe grandparents are the ones that are taking the kid to dance and parents aren't super involved, or they could be being raised by any and an uncle, they could have two dads. You know, if you're using the term family, 
Um, I've also used adult. I'll be like, can everyone go get their adult? Go get your grown up. If I'm trying to get, you know, the adult in the room to come watch them do a fun dance to say to kids, go get your grown up. Yeah. It's like my favorite (laughs) one. (laughs) Go get them. I love that. Um, so I think using switching yourself, even from trying not to say mom or dad, because that might not be who's involved, right? You know, so using adult grown up family. I like that. That's a great tip. You know, you and I had some really straight heart to heart. I think there might've been tears <laughs> shed, um, yes. when, when we were going through just some big decisions about how you were going to communicate to our families. Yeah. Because you, I, under, I recognize that everybody listening to this is in different parts of the country and different Absolutely. places and pockets where these conversations have happened or not happened. And by all means, this is not to say that what we went through is the same for you, but you and right. I were worried. There was concern yeah. that if you coming out as one of our faculty members who was a queer woman, that there could be some backlash with that. And I said, it's 20, 20 or 20, you know, I said, yeah. we can't, that was a year ago. And we can't have <laughs> that. I, I won't, I will yeah. lose those families before I worry that they go away because you're such a loving presence to our students and you're such a positive influence. So help me help our listeners yeah. who are worried or there's could be backlash. Well, first of all, thank you. Um, and it was definitely a process and I would not to use the word brave again. I wouldn't have felt brave enough to do it without your support. So thank you. Unfortunately, I think it's a tough choice for studios where they have to make the same choice that you did in saying, I'd rather lose those families. And if you're okay with losing those, and if you're not, then some of these policies, you might not be able to roll out. Um, And you might have to, maybe you can do it on a quieter case-by-case basis, you know, um, making allowances for certain students. And even that could be something you say in class, like, if this dress code feels uncomfortable, please come speak to me. And, but if that is something you're willing to do to be that uh, space for members of the LGBTQ community, when you roll those out, you might get backlash. And I think that having the language of we are committed to being a space where members of the LGBTQ plus community feel embraced by our studio. I am so sorry that that does not align with your personal views. Maybe this isn't the studio for you. Yeah. And that's, that's what I'm like. I feel so empowered by the conversations you and I have had. And I hope that everyone listening to this feels the love and support too, is that nothing was clearer to me than when we've been faced down with tra- tough times, COVID, to be like, you know what, I'm clearer than ever on what I'm committed to, what my mission is here at this dance studio, what I would fight for, and what I will go to bat for. And there is a dance studio out there for everybody. Not everybody Absolutely. is alive, right? You've been, listen, yeah. you've taught at them, you've been to them, yeah. you've worked for them, you know, there's And so if anything, what I hope everyone listening to this call is like, you know what, I'm finally, I'm creating my brave space for my kids. And it's now is a great time as we go into the summer and we go into a new dance season or whenever you're listening to this to be like, no, you know what, it's time. And it's time for us to like create that space on all the things. And this is just, this is one component of it that really matters. So when you sit there at home and you think about the things you want to share with studio owners, I know you have some resources and you're going to be available yes. to our listeners if they want some help in this area. So talk a little bit about what, yeah. you, what you're going to be able to help with. Yeah, absolutely. So I am kind of creating a package workshop sort of thing that's going to not that's going to kind of start at the basics. It's going to talk about pronouns. It's going to talk about the big alphabet soup acronym. The most formal one I've ever heard is 2SLGBTQIA+. All right. It's lengthy. And I am so happy to talk it through with anyone, um, kind of talking about why they might be seeing Um, A lot more kids identify as part of that community, which has a lot to do with the fact that we lost so many LGBTQ elders. We lost an entire generation in the AIDS epidemic. Um, So now it just feels like there's more, but there's really not. But also kids have access to so much more information. So they can be luckier than me who came out in their 20s. 
literally to myself as well. Um, right. So, <laughs> you know, they're right. getting access and realizing things a lot sooner, um, kind of talking through all of that. All the way through, I am happy to look at policies. I am happy to help consult and write them. I am happy to help you set up little role-playing scenarios with your teachers because I think that is so valuable. So that way, when something happens, you're like, oh, I literally know the words to say. You know, like when, what do you do when a student comes out to you? What do you do when a student comes out to you and is like, my parents don't know? You know, like how can you keep your student safe, which is always the number one concern is keeping kids safe. You know, how do you navigate that kind of situation? Exactly. So we're going to, in the show notes, have a link out to your website so that people can learn more about your training um, that you will offer um, if someone's interested in learning about how they can um, connect with you and and learn more. Because I do think um, our faculty need the support ourselves as studio owners. We need the support, our office staff, getting everyone aligned is getting everyone on the same page is like the first yeah. step. Right. Right. And then, and so it sounds like you're going to be able to help facilitate that and really make it less, less complicated, break it down. You're very um, open. And, and I love that about you, Sam. You're always great about letting people ask you questions about that. And yeah, that feel, absolutely. you never make anyone feel like it's awkward. Um, to ask right. And that's my big thing is I want um, the language I love to use is calling people in instead of calling people out you know, calling people in to be like, Hey, like not the best word choice. Let's, can I offer you something different, you know, and how, and helping them navigate through things. That's awesome. Wow. Well, this has been great. So I know that, I mean, our listeners might have more questions. Of course, they can always hit us up on our podcast contact us page. Um, our support at dancestudioowner.com is a great email address. Um, Sam is part of our dancestudioowner.com member community because she is on my faculty. She's been a great team member, but she's more than that. She's an extraordinary resource um, for studio owners and dance teachers alike, um, as you are certainly experienced. And you have, like I said before, she's a great choreographer and dance teacher too, and a lot of fun. And um, I just appreciate you, Sam. And thanks for being our special guest today. We hope this um, helps you. Is there any last words you want to share with our listeners before we go? Well, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm so happy that this will be coming out during pride month, which is June. Um, and I am just so excited that so many members of our community are wanting to help create more inclusive spaces. And I, the young dancer in me wishes I could have had it, but is more excited to help create it for others. Thank you, Sam. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Dance Studio 411. Visit us online at dancestudio411.com for more great resources and to submit a question for a future episode. Our number one goal is to help you build a successful dance studio business and keep your passion for dance alive. Dance Studio 411.